So hello everyone and welcome to another um, webinar from SFP UQS student chapter. Today we have Professor Negar Elhami Khorasani uh, from University Buffalo at New York. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Negar, thank you for uh, joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the SFB chapter, uh, University of Queensland, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, uh, join in this um, talk, basically, and give uh, provide some of my research updates here. So my name is Nagar Elhami Krasani. I'm an associate professor at the University of Buffalo. Uh, my area of research covers performance-based design as well as the resilience of structures and communities to extreme events, including earthquakes, fire, and wildfire, as well as cascading events such as fire following earthquakes. And I've been involved in um, different projects. Uh, currently, I am co-chairing the ASC Fire Protection Committee here in the US, and I'm involved with several other committees. So my work spans different um, um, uh, scales in terms of uh, individual structures all the way to communities. For this specific, for today's uh, talk, I would like to um, present uh, results from one of our uh, recent projects on enhancing the resilience of tunnels subject to fire events. So let me uh, share my screen. Um, okay. Oh, that should do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. So this work um, has been supported by uh, uh, the Department of Transportation here in the United States, as well as uh, we have Institute of Bridge Engineering here at University at Buffalo. And um, at the end, I will thank my, my students, you know, collaborators and so on. So this is the result of a collaboration uh, in our team. Uh, I'm just uh, presenting our work today. So in terms of uh, motivation of our work uh, and what we're looking at, so tunnel fires are a low probability but high consequence events in the sense that uh, uh, once, uh, if a fire starts in a tunnel, it's a confined space and the nature of fuel within the tunnel, fire can then reach high temperatures quickly. And um, the suppression could be a challenge. So in existing events, when we, we have observed uh, uh, that the tunnel structure uh, may not collapse, but uh, it can experience severe damage, which would lead to economic losses. As, and that and the downtime of the tunnel, which uh, if it's a critical um, um, tunnel as part of a, the transportation network, then that downtime time again um, affects um, the economy and uh, social aspects within that community. So uh, these are critical infrastructure. We would need to have a, a rapid resumption of service and functionality. And uh, what uh, we don't have is basically a lot of our guidelines for damage assessment. Uh, we look at them deterministically. We don't necessarily have performance-based design approaches and frameworks um, for these uh, damage assessment and repair strategies. Uh, therefore, uh, our work started with uh, coming up with a framework for tunnel fire damage assessment. So, any fire structure problem, it has three uh, primary um, elements. The first element is defining the fire scenario. So we started looking at um, elements and inputs and parameters that contribute to the fire scenario, such as the type of fuel, the type of ventilation, tunnel slope, fire spread within the tunnel, and so on. And we actually use computational fluid dynamic analysis uh, to get the spatial and temporal distribution of fire temperature within the fire, uh, within the tunnel. Now, once we have the temperature uh, across the tunnel, we can do heat transfer analysis uh, to get the temperature within the reinforced concrete liner. And um, that temperature uh, we can use to perform structural analysis, looking at the deflection and looking at 
um, the level of damage to the uh, concrete liner, knowing, uh, again, soil properties, mechanical properties of material, uh, spalling, and so on. So all these parameters that I've listed on the left, there are uncertainties associated with them. So during the presentation, I will talk about uh, these steps. And within each step, we will talk about some uncertainties and how to characterize them and how they would affect uh, the level of damage. And once we have these three steps, obviously the way we were thinking is that, okay, uh, we can use our models to um, guide that damage assessment of pre, before we, if we are designing a new structure, so we can um, do some risk assessment. And if it's an existing structure, we can use to um, guide the repair strategy. So for using the models, we need to verify them. And in order to verify them, we need um, large scale experiments. Uh, and we could use material testing as well. So I'm gonna also talk about how we um, did some experiments in order to validate some of our models and from there, we actually then can use, once we have these model verifications done, we can then use the outputs from heat transfer as well as mecha thermal mechanical analysis to perform damage assessment and repair strategies. The last part would be, once we know that, to evaluate downtime and economic losses. We are not there yet, so I'm going to pretty much stop around this point in this presentation. Uh, but that would be the flow, like step by step, I'm going to um, go through these boxes. So in the first step is the fire scenario. And we want here to determine the tunnel fire scenarios for a passenger railway tunnel considering uncertainty. So that was the framework, but we're now specifically looking at a case and um, talking about that. Uh, so here are some of the standard fire curves that we know. Um, uh, they're not, uh, it's, we have more of these, you know that, but uh, here's just a sample. Uh, the gray one is the ISO 834, which is the for uh, different type of fuel is for buildings. It has a slower um, rate of uh, increase in temperature compared to the all the other ones that are hydrocarbon fires. And these hydrocarbon fires, um, we see the red one uh, is the RWS uh, curve that goes uh, to 1300 degrees Celsius and has a fast ramp up. Uh, we're going to use that later on in the research, given that it's pretty much the most conservative one, but it doesn't have a cooling phase. And the two German ones wrapped um, fire curves, these two um, um, have a cooling uh, phase. And again, we're going to use them at some point in this presentation to look at the behavior after complete cooling. Okay, we do already have in the literature equations for a maximum temperature within the tunnel. So these um, studies, um, we, this equation specifically, it's a work by Dr. Ingesson and uh, we have, we can use inputs on ventilation, on uh, a type of heat release rate, radius of fire source and so on and get a maximum temperature. But um, and th this has been calibrated with pool fires and single car fire test data. Uh, so it, it works, but it gives the maximum temperature. However, when we want to evaluate damage and we want to do risk assessment, we would need to know the spatial again and temp uh, temporal distribution of temperature uh, along the tunnel. So we don't want to assign that maximum temperature everywhere uh, because that would be too conservative or too unrealistic of an assessment uh, for damage. So what we ended up doing then was to use um, FDS, a fire dynamic simulator. It's uh, a computation, um, computationally it's expensive. And um, however, it does provide um, uh, good information, um, relatively complete information in terms of uh, fire um, and the scenario that happens during inside the tunnel. So we aim to capture uh, the fire spread uh, within the tunnel. And I'll explain how we did that. And then without going into the details, we verified uh, our modeling approach uh, using uh, small scale and more like large scale uh, testing programs that we found in the literature. So the models were first validated, uh, a modeling approach was validated and then we moved on. Okay, so our, we are applying um, the framework on a case study 
the prototype um, um, tunnel section that we use. This is the Howard Street Tunnel in Baltimore, Maryland in the United States. Uh, and it has a horseshoe shape. Um, and we modeled a section of the tunnel and we're assuming a passenger train is going inside. Uh, there is a ventilation and um, we have a number of train cars. And what's going to happen is that several parameters are going to be varied in order to run 540 simulations with FTS to capture those uncertainties. So the first variable is the heat release rate. Now we went back to the heat release rates uh, from uh, experiments, real experiments within the literature, we collected those and then we ended up um, category, um, basically quantifying the uh, range and um, observed uh, values in the ramp up temperature, ramp up heat release rate, the, the, the rate going up, the uh, constant at the top, and then the again the rate coming down. So using these three variables, we generated randomly ten of these heat release um, rates uh, using Latin hypercube sampling. So these are ten curves, and then the ventilation velocity, we identified, we calculated the critical velocity for this tunnel, and then we varied. Um, a percentage of uh, that minus plus a uh, standard deviation uh, to get to three different ventilation velocities. So a bit slower basically than the critical velocity, a bit higher than critical velocity because it's not going to be exactly perhaps at that value. And then the tunnel stop varied between 2.2% um, zero and minus 2.2%. Um, the, the reason for the, the two 0.2% value is coming uh, from the steepest section of the Cascade Tunnel in Washington State in the US, uh, which serves both passenger and freight trains. So we wanted to look at this effect of the slope and fire spreading. So the fire, uh, the initial ignition could happen the first uh, train car or the third train car, and then the fire can spread based on the ignition temperature, um, three different values. Uh, these are again based on data. Uh, of ignition temperatures of train cars varying between 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. So um, 10 times three times three times, you know, the combination here gives us 540 simulations. So when we, so results, I am going to and, uh, divide the results section into two, um, two cases. First, um, we're going to look at the maximum temperature, similar to the, the equation I showed earlier. So we are going to have, and for all cases, we're going to have the temperature time. We're going to idealize all the results into a trilinear model. Um, again, we have the heating, we have the duration of maximum temperature and the cooling, and we have um, quantified the range and uncertainties in, in these three uh, values, as well as the duration of the maximum temperature. So looking at the maximum temperature, just the cap uh, temperature, we actually saw a bimodal uh, variation in the uh, probability density function. So by bimodal, it means that there were two clear peak values, peaks in the uh, density function. What was happening is that, um, what was happening is that we have um, low intensity, we label them as low intensity versus high intensity. The actual the values of HRR, the heat release rate, made a difference in a sense that if HRR was less than 30 megawatts, then our maximum temperature pretty much stayed lower than 600 degrees Celsius um, with a mean around 300 degrees Celsius. And then HRR larger than 40, uh, we reached an average temperature around 1000 degrees Celsius. And in between 30 and 40, it really depends on ventilation. So I'm not showing uh, the PDF here, the probability density function. But what happened was that, that it could go either way, depending on the value of ventilation. So uh, this is, I know, a lot of uh, information in one slide, but I pretty much have, a, I'll give you the takeaway point here. So what we're plotting here now for damage assessment is the actual spatial and temporal distribution of fire. So what's happening is that at different um, uh, 
a height within the cross section. So given a cross section, if you cut the tunnel uh, at 1.3 meters, 3.9 meters, and 6.4 meters, this is the crown basically at the top of the um, ceiling of the tunnel. Um, there's temperature recording as well as along the tunnel. So from negative 30 meters to 210 meters, meters across the tunnel length, we are uh, looking at the temperature distribution. And you can see that as you go to the crown, obviously um, probably easier for high intensity fires, you see that the temperature increases compared to uh, you know, lower parts of the cross section, that's meaningful. And then uh, if you go, inside the tunnel, given the fire spread, um, somewhere around perhaps 60 meters in from our um, reference point, we get the maximum uh, temperatures. And then we also have time to reach that peak temperature in a sense that we're looking temporally when at what time uh, during the fire we actually see that maximum temperature. Okay. So now we talked about uh, characterizing the variations in temperature. Now I want to move on to the second step, which is characterizing fire damage to a prototype reinforced concrete tunnel liner is the same case study based on the distribution of fire temperature within this tunnel space and effect of spalling. Here we're just going to rely, this is the second step, we're going to rely on heat transfer analysis. So um, we know that concrete at um, elevate, we know concrete performs in terms of uh, concrete structures overall, they perform um, relatively well because of their low thermal conductivity and they have a high cross section, uh, sectional mass. So it takes a long time for them to heat up. This is, you know, a, um, uh, let's say concrete section, it's being heated from one side and it takes, you know, it's the ISO fire basically. And you see the core of the section remains uh, cool um, after, um, sometime being exposed to the ISO curve. So we know that, but one problem is that we the concrete structure could experience spalling, especially um, um, high strength concrete. So uh, we wanted to incorporate, even if a simplified um, way, the, the best we could do to act, actually capture the possibility of spalling and the effect on damage. So in order to do that, now we're going to set up our heat transfer. So the first step is that, well, we need the spatial distribution of temperature across the tunnel. That's coming from the results I just um, showed. We have that. Next is the spalling model. So uh, we created this temperature and time dependent spalling predictive model. It's a simplified approach. Uh, we know that, but we thought it's better than not including it. So what happens is that at certain time, which is a function of the fire temperature, the spalling starts, it has a linear rate, and then it's it basically stops. When does it stop? When it actually reaches the reinforcement. So the concrete cover is completely spalled. Uh, that's the ending point. And this rate, so the T start and the rate, uh, they are both coming from um, just the data we collected. We went back to a um, series of experiments, um, range of experiments done in the literature. We collected all of them. And then from there, we decided that purely data driven, we, we picked a value for T start. Um, and for uh, the rate uh, going up. And then it was harder to determine when it stops just solely based on the data. That's why we cap it when the uh, spalling actually the, the con uh, reaches um, the reinforcement. So how did we actually include it in our modeling? Uh, we are using Saphir. Um, you, um, sure some of you on the call already know. It's a well-established structural fire engineering um, software, final element software um, developed at University of Liege. So what we did, we um, basically created this interactive MATLAB Saphir program that automatically um, goes through the process for us. So we start you know, in Saphir, there's no spalling, temperatures are low, then it heats up. There is a very fine mesh here when the, the um, cover can um, spall. And then what happens within this um, basically uh, automated um, uh, approach as soon as it hits uh, the temperature that we have specified based on data, then uh, the program hits in, uh, it starts removing layers 
uh, given this rate, and then it stops when it reaches the reinforcement. These red dots in the mesh, those are the reinforcement um, in the concrete liner. Okay, so having that, um, uh, we also, as a last step, we basically quantify, this is heat transfer, we're not in the structural analysis yet. We are actually uh, quantifying the volume of concrete that is exceeding temperature of 300 degrees Celsius, uh, because that's a threshold that beyond which um, is recommended to replace concrete. Um, different sources um, exist uh, in the literature because the concrete actually changes um, you know, its properties. Uh, so that is one way that we want to see how much damage um, we have uh, purely just based on heat transfer. So the damage volume of concrete is being calculated. Um, our, the rate of spalling here is three millimeters per minute, and it starts at 750 degrees Celsius. So the low intensity fires that I showed earlier, these are low temperature fires. We did not have any case out of all those 540 cases, we did not have any damage volume of concrete. That makes sense because the concrete remains pretty cool. It uh, doesn't reach 300 degrees Celsius. But for high intensity fires, we see a range of potential uh, results for damage volume of concrete. The maximum value that we observed was 226 cubic meter, which is equivalent to 37 mixer trucks. So if um, they're bringing uh, concrete on site to replace that's equivalent of 37 mixer trucks. And we translated that uh, so that when we are communicating with our stakeholders in this project, um, we give them some sort of an idea. And then the mean value for damage volume of concrete is about 14 trucks or 86 uh, cubic meters. So um, if we want to again put it in context, the normalized maximum DVC for high intensity fires. So if I take this value and divide it by the total volume of concrete that I, we have in that section of the tunnel that we are analyzing is about 16%. Uh, now, if I want to make a comparison of including spalling versus not including spalling. So if we actually don't include spalling, then our maximum from 226 drops to 142 and from 86 drops to 50. So um, it's actually um, not conservative uh, when we don't include spalling, we know that. So we are more comfortable with the uh, first assessment. Okay, now we're done with heat transfer. Uh, we're gonna move on to the structural analysis and evaluate structural performance of tunnel during both heating and cooling and including the effect of soil conditions. I am going to um, change gears a little bit here in the sense that uh, given you know, the time, um, I will switch to a different case study. We did the analysis continue for the same case study, but uh, this one has more interesting results. So that's why I wanna show it to them, show it to you. Uh, this way. Uh, so what's the thinking here? First of all, um, this is a um, figure, uh, not for tunnels, this is um, adopted from uh, Professor Kuder's research. Uh, we have, there's a beam, concrete beam, um, it's being heated, and this is the temperature time. You see the red is the fire temperature, um, the yellow is the rebar temperature and the blue is the concrete temperature. So what's happening is that the peak of the fire temperature is happening at this point. Uh, while you see the peak in the rebar and concrete, um, although it's cooler, but it's happening after that fire peak in a sense that there's a delay uh, in reaching the maximum temperature again because concrete has um, a low thermal conductivity. So uh, given that, when we look at the mid-span deflection of that reinforced concrete beam, um, it starts, there's some deflection due to the applied load, then it, uh, you see the displacement once it's sub subjected to fire, uh, but the max, the peak deflection happens during the cooling phase of the fire, it's actually happening here. And then once, um, and then eventually there's some recovery during the cooling and then there's the post um, fire um, residual basically displacement. So the point is that we wanted to um, look into also the effect of cooling and that will be the theme in, the, in some of the upcoming slides. So that's why that wrapped fire that I mentioned earlier uh, will come into the picture as well as the RWS. Okay, so 
we want to look at the effect of the uh, the fire effect of fire on the structure performance. We do have several parameters that we want to look at. One is tunnel geometry. So far, I've been talking about the horseshoe um, tunnel, but I'm going to switch to a circular one right now again because of the the results that we got. Uh, and but we know that there is an effect from the geometry. There's fire intensity, material properties. Um, obviously, there's elevated temperature as well as residual. Again, that cooling, if the concrete doesn't fully recover, soil conditions, does it actually make a difference what kind of soil uh, we have? Um, um, and then effect of spalling. So uh, a lot of uncertainty is going on. I will show some of our interesting results. Here's the um, four cases that we considered. These are representative geologic profiles of actually realistic tunnels. So what happened was that um, we took four actual tunnels and we adopted, they're not exactly, you know, but we adopted the, the geologic profiles from these cases. There's a board tunnel, they're all board, board tunnels. Uh, and we have a range from a soft, a shallow um, tunnel in the soft soil to a deep tunnel in rock and as well as the moderate ones, right? So shallow, soft, moderate, soft, moderate rock and deep rock. And we want to know whether, um, again, the soil condition would make a difference in response of the structure. This is the schematic um, of the four um, cases. And each layer, each color basically um, shows a different um, soil condition. Again, they're adopted from those real cases that I had listed in the previous slide. Um, there's also the water table, so water pressure is also included. So when we are modeling this, other than the soil pressure or rock, um, we also have pressure from water. Um, and then inside the tunnel, we have we we'll have the self weight of the structure as well as the live load that's going in. Okay. Um, so the way we model these in order to look at the effect of the soil, we have the we are still using Saphir. We have a beam spring model in the sense that the tunnel liner is modeled using beam elements, and we have um, we're modeling using symmetry, basically capturing the boundary. We have half of the tunnel, and this the soil structure interaction is modeled using these springs, where the stiffness of the soil is um, assigned to these springs, and the top. Uh, half of the tunnel is subjected to uh, fire and the fire scenarios, there is the wrapped fire and there's the RWS. With the wrapped fire, we want to see the residual recovery uh, of the structure after it's completely cooled down. And then we use RWS because we got a question from, again, um, a, a question came up at uh, some point during the project by um, our, our fire department, basically asking us that it was it was a fire chief he asked us that okay uh you yes we understand that it takes a long time for the tunnel section to actually collapse but um let's say the fire keeps uh burning it would help uh us to know when would it fail if it actually helps to give us an idea of what sort of how much time do we have if the fire continues to burn uh, in terms of safety uh, uh, purposes, um, and it's safe for us to work inside the tunnel, try to confine the fire. So what happened was that we actually, um, you'll see uh, that I cont we continue that fire for you know hours and hours, hundred hours, uh, to see whether the section fails and at what time does it fail. Okay, so uh, for again, sake of time, there's just plenty here. I'm just gonna show you one sample case here for which is the T2 is this one, the one that start moderate depth tunnel soft soil just to see what in detail and then give a summary a comparison of all cases to um, discuss the effect of uh, soil type. Okay, so what we did for the wrapped fire, basically we have the, um, um, fire that's the the pink area is the, the heating cons, uh, including the uh, plateau and you can see that again the um the reinforcement so there's the inner reinforcement up outer reinforcement in green and then in mid depth of concrete so the inner reinforcement that's darker blue the maximum actually happens after the peak of the fire 
And then it takes some time. We are running the uh, simulation up to 72 hours to make sure that completely in equilibrium and nothing is changing within the tunnel structure anymore. So 72 hours is completely cooled down, structure is settled, everything's back to you know its status, normal. And I find equilibrium basically. Um, and this is the crown deflection that again, it continues to the form well after the fire is over. So this is, you know, two hours wrapped fire, you know, four hours, 10 hours, 24 hours. We still see that we don't, we are not at equilibrium. Finally, 74, 20 hours, it finds um, a spinal state. This is another way of looking at the same results. Uh, from the geotechnical perspective, there is a term ovality, um, which basically shows the change um, in the um, def deflected shape of the uh, tunnel uh, section, the circular tunnel section, by comparing the lateral as well as the vertical deflections. So it's using D max minus D mean um, divided by the original. So with that ovality, what we started due to you know, ambient condition at point uh, five, and then it changed all the way to point uh, 75. So th these numbers um, have a meaning for our geotechnical tunnel engineers. Basically, they wanna know uh, what percentage um, change uh, occurred after the fire. And this is obviously displaced like 50, so we're um, magnifying, but 10 minutes, two hours, four hours, again, um, 10 and 24 hours, we still see changes uh, similar to the previous slide. So uh, now going into the details, looking at you know moment, axial force, ovality, rebar temperature, rebar stress, we looked at you know several again. Don't again, don't want you to get confused with all these numbers. I have a takeaway point. So looking at all these details, we're looking for you know four several four cases case studies with different soil conditions. And what's happening is that um, the uh, highlighted, those are the, the highlighted in uh, blue, um, those are really reaching the maximum among four of them. And what's happening in TS2, which is a moderate depth tunnel soft versus deep tunnel rock, uh, we have pretty large forces, moment and axial force in uh, the deep tunnel rock section, and we have the rebar stress yielding. On the other hand, we also have the rebar stress yielding in moderate depths um, uh, and soft soil, but it's not too much of a force, it's more of a, a deflection. Uh, so we have a 0.25% change delta in ovality here, whereas it's pretty much 0 0.09 in a rock um, tunnel. So the difference between TS2 and TS4 uh, these two came out to be the most critical, but there is a major difference in the sense that in soft soil, the tunnel cross section can actually move because it's soft soil, so it's low stiffness. Uh, and the rebar, for example, yields and there's large deformations. But in the deep tunnel and rock, um, we, the tunnel section cannot really move in the sense that the displacements are pretty small. Uh, but because there's a lot of load on the tunnel, it's deep tunnel, then um, our, it shows up in, internally as forces. And then again, we see yielding of reinforcement. Uh, so uh, the two critical cases we identified was moderate depth soft and deep tunnel rock. And um, because of different reasons though. So um, Next is the RWS fire. Again, going back to the question by the fire department, um, how long does it take for these fires to, to for these um, uh, tunnels to collapse if we let the fire to burn? And um, here that we uh, ran the RWS for 100 hours, we stopped at that point. So after 100 hours, uh, TS1, shallow tunnel, soft soil, so not much load, low stiffness, uh, did not collapse. Moderate depth tunnel in rock did not collapse. But again, TS2 and TS4, the two cases that we also showed in the previous slide, some um, um, more critical ones, uh, we have basically what we call runaway failure in a sense that the displacement, um, the rate of displacement uh, in the cross section is uh, really large. So the software pretty much stops because the, the cross section is moving um, too quickly. So it's, it's basically failing. 
Um, in TS2, after 45 hours, uh, we have that runaway failure at the crown. In TS4, which is the deep tunnel, after 52 hours, we actually have the um, runaway failure at the spring line of the tunnel. This study does not consider the change in the effect of temperature on soil behavior. So soil is it's having constant stiffness. We wanted to push a little bit the limit of what we can do. And we thought that, OK, uh, what actually, so the concrete section obviously doesn't transfer heat to the backside, to the soil um, too much. But um, when the duration of the fire is long, uh, the soil uh, reaches temperatures in the order of, you know, 90, 100, so F 90 degrees Celsius. So um, after, let me see, I'll explain. After 11 hours, after 11 hours of RWS, the soil reaches about 90 degrees Celsius. And we are testing now clay. Let's say that soil is clay. So what's happening at those temperatures that, um, the uh, uh, increase in temperature causes the um, excess poor water pressure um, inside the soil, um, it, it, it increases because of that uh, thermal expansion of poor water. And this excess poor uh, water, uh, poor pressure reduces the effective stress in soil. And that um, reduction of effective stress decreases the elastic modulus, uh, which is basically our input to the springs. Uh, however, the thermal hardening inside uh, soil at the same time increases the elastic modulus. So the, the, we considered both of them and we got a net change in E. And this is coming from the um, um, data, basically, again, uh, experiments uh, from geotechnical engineers, uh, temperatures. And we, we found data, again, up to about 90, 100 degrees Celsius. And that's why we stopped the simulation. But what we want to I want to show you is that this is the original solution, basically previous slide. Now, looking at data, we got data from the you know different set of data, so lower bound and upper bound of what we found in the literature, that can um, change the results. And for um, the upper bound of excess pore pressure again um, maps to reducing the stiffness. So we are actually going from about 85 millimeters at the crown displacement uh, to 115 millimeters at crown displa displacement when we consider the effect of temperature on soil. So that's something that we cannot ignore, and it's a part that we want to uh, study more in future. OK, finally, the last part. This is the fire damage assessment. So now we experimentally investigated fire damage to reinforce concrete slabs, and we wanted to verify our models. These are the um, list, the list of, um, not all, but um, some of the available guidelines that we have for damage assessment. Uh, Portland Cement Association, that's in the US, ACI, American Concrete Institute, that's again in the US. This is an international, you know, FIP. Concrete Society in the UK and so on. So we looked at all of them. And if we want to basically summarize everything that we know um, or the guide guidance provided here, it, it's more what we see in the left, which is, OK, look at, you know, do visual inspection. We can do non-destructive testing, can get some sampling of material and laboratory testing. And the rest is pretty much an ad hoc basis. Uh, and uh, do some dam there are damage classifications within these guidelines and repair classifications associated with that with those damage classifications. So what do we want uh, to do moving forward in this project is to incorporate some guidance using advanced modeling and analysis to get sectional temperature structural response. If we know what happened in the tunnel during the fire, we can use that for to map to those damage classifications and if it's a new tunnel, obviously a design, we can do risk assessment using um, analysis of the models. So we did a few tests uh, first, and then we did verified our models. Uh, this is a furnace um, at the University of Buffalo. And I am going to play this video and talk over this. Hopefully it works. There you go. So this is, let me pause it. 
this is the kind it's gonna you, you're gonna see the full slab this is a side of the slab it's post tension i'll explain why it's post tension bear with me and this is one of the supports this is the gray box is the uh, furnace so uh the slab is sitting on top of the furnace it's an electric furnace uh, with um it's designed to accommodate fast heating rates so the coils are designed such that they can accommodate fast heating rates uh, the heat, it, this is like a crown uh, element of a tunnel. It's heated from below. Um, it's loaded from the top to simulate the effect of the soil um, and any load coming from the top. Um, this is um, a uh, spreader beam just to spread the load. This is a mechanical actuator. And then we have all the thermocouples inside this lab to uh, measure the temperature in the section. Uh, we did add a mesh here. Uh, this was for safety reasons. We didn't know whether this is going to spall or not. You'll see actually we tested four slabs. One of them spalled. And this came in handy in order to um, protect the uh, furnace elements. Uh, the post tensioning why they're there is because if imagine you've got a section of the tunnel, if it's going to um, expand during fire, uh, the rest of the section is going to push back, right? So these strands, they, we, again, on the next slide, you'll see we have different versions. They mimic the restrain effect from the rest of the structure. And then we have the control system and the monitoring system for load as well as temperatures uh, during the test. So our idea was to use uh, four slabs and we are mo uh, looking at uh, temperatures, looking at displacement, um, both maximum as, as well as residual. So we had four slabs, uh, test one or slab one had six uh, strands. It had 0.22% polypropylene fibers. Uh, which indeed prevented spalling, you'll see. And um, the fire uh, again mimics a railway, you know, same uh, theme as before is the railway uh, tunnel, a uh, passenger railway fire. So it goes up to 850 degrees Celsius. Um, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, 40 degrees Celsius per minute um, in terms of the ramp up, and then it cools down. Uh, then we had a uh, test to similar fire scenario, but um, less number of strands, which uh, this is a difference between um, a rectangular versus a horseshoe tunnel in terms of level of restraint they would provide. We had this quick fire, and uh, this is test three, uh, a quick fire where basically what's happening, it's going up, you know, about 700 degrees and it dies down. This is mimicking a fixed firefighting system inside a tunnel. So if uh, the tunnel has a fixed firefighting system, it gets activated, it cools down. So technically we should not see any damage in that slab. That's what we were hoping for from the structural point of view. And then we use that slab to do another test which mimics some sort of a traveling fire with a delay. So there's some heat coming from you know, somewhere else in the tunnel until the fire actually arrives to the slab and then uh, dies down. And finally, test uh, four is the fourth slab. Everything is the same as the first slab, except there's no uh, uh, polypropylene fibers. So we expected some spalling there. And these uh, specimens were designed um, based on typical tunnel sections. So the reinforcement, everything is consistent. Uh, they are 1.8 meters by 2.4 meters by 0.3 meters. Uh, in terms of concrete strength, we are in the order of um, about 70 MPA um, in terms of strength. Okay, so I'm going to show you the results now. With all these results, we have basically, um, I'm going to go through the step, step by step of what I show. So first, we're going to do visual inspection, then some uh, non-destructive testing, some material testing, and then eventually get to what we want to do, which is modeling. In terms of visually, uh, what we observed, um, so test one, two, um, after second test 3B, uh, somewhat they're all cracked. Uh, 3A, which is, was the quick fire, is the only one that um, it's not too bad though, but the 3A is definitely a minimal damage and can be, you know, um, resume functionality immediately. Uh, test four, well, that was the one without polypropylene fibers. You can definitely see that it's all, you know, spalled. Uh, you can even see in one corner, um, we got to the point that some of the reinforcements started to get exposed. 
in terms of the non-destructive testing with the Schmidt hammer test. So we conducted the Schmidt hammer test on five points. They're shown in these um, blue dash lines. Uh, and then given the variation in the results of Schmidt hammer test, we did 10, 10 tests per point. And then you see the variation basically on these bars. Um, and we're showing also the average. So the average of you know, all these cases across the five locations for test one, two, um, you know, three B and four, it's about 20% reduction. Now, depending on some conditions, about 20% reduction. The three A was the quick fire. We actually see a point plus, plus 6%. So increase in strength of concrete, which makes sense because the concrete temperature actually reached about you know 100 less than less than 200 degrees Celsius. So that level of heat actually helps with additional hydration of concrete. So the strength actually picked up rather than um, you know dropping. Okay, material testing. We also did cylinders. Uh, these are not, you know, course from the slab, but we did cylinder and for for uh, residual compressive strength of our same concrete material. We poured uh, the slabs with, and we calculate. We measured the residual strength um, on the cylinders. You see the change in color going from twenty to nine hundred degrees Celsius. We do see it's more whitish. It's somewhat pinkish here. Uh, that sort of color change was harder. Uh, to detect on the actual slabs. And then um, the reduction factors we got was more or less uh, similar to what's prescribed by Eurocode. Okay, finally, last step is the modeling. Uh, so in the terms of modeling, uh, we're using again Saphir. We decided that we're gonna explore. So this is this happened before the test, this did not. So we wanted to get some predictions, right? Um, and we um, we looked at different levels of details of testing of modeling we can do. So there is beam uh, model, shell, as well as solid. Um, the beam model is perhaps too simplified that we um, that basically comparison with the experiment uh, results confirm that uh, the solid is too complex and we had some issues uh, during cooling. So it actually does a good job during heating for predicting the heating behavior, but uh, it, during cooling with the strain uh, stress reversals, um, the model um, had some convergence issues. And then the shell element I am going to focus on here uh, actually uh, provided reasonable results. So we have uh, the uh, concrete slab model as the shell. This is the heated area. We have the applied load. We have the boundary condition. We have the heat transfer first. The um, dot, dot circles uh, are the actual um, data. The dash, the lines are the model. And um, there is a little bit of a discrepancy, but the discrepancy, honestly, um, it's because some of these thermocouples, uh, we, we put them before we pour concrete. And then we're pouring concrete in these slabs, there's you know, some pressure from that concrete. So uh, whether that thermocouple is staying exactly at 25 millimeters, um, that probably not. So that explains that. Um, and then the displacement, this is the displacement of the um, mid, mid span at um, test one, um, the, at the beginning time zero, before the fire starts, the model is stiffer. Again, we are not too surprised because uh, reinforced concrete uh, modeling, you know, we, we, we expected to see that in reality uh, versus experiments. Um, uh, we got a model that was stiffer, that was okay. But um, it does actually capture properly the fire behavior as well as the residual um, displacement. So this is after 24 hours when everything again stabilized. So if I summarize everything I presented so far, um, you know, based on observations, uh, we could have crack, a level of spalling, you know, uh, concrete, uh, the Schmidt hammer test. Now, what we're suggesting is that to supplement this kind of um, uh, observations with model outputs, if we know again what kind of fire happened inside the tunnel to get the temperatures, 
and then record maximum bottom rebar temperature or the residual displacement. And we could have also performance thresholds against these um, categories that uh, we are getting out of the models. So what we are working on right now is that we say, okay, this is just a sample, not that, you know, uh, there's something special about concrete society guidelines, but they're pretty much similar uh, with other guidelines as well. But you get a table like this where it says, okay, you know, damage classification and then definition of each damage classification. And now what we want to, we are working on is that, okay, with these damage classifications, can I now map damage classification one to depth of concrete reaching temperatures, you know, larger than 300 degrees Celsius. That's probably right now, this is just a pure suggestion at this point, we're working on it, the research continues. So that could be less than half of the cover depth. And that kind of increases as we move on for the other damage classes. Um, temperature of reinforcement, less than 100 degrees Celsius or with re negligible residual displacement that maps to, you know, damage class one and so on. So that's where we are heading um, in this research. So with that, um, basically what I covered today is that we looked at um, series of fire scenarios, about 540 for a given, you know, railway tunnel case with varying heat release rate, ventilation velocities, tunnel slope, and so on to get the spatial distribution of temperature within the tunnel. And we use that spatial distribution of temperature to calculate the volume of uh, damaged concrete uh, to get um, a metric for the level of damage um, uh, in the tunnel and we consider spalling in our assessment. Uh, also, we looked at the effect of soil um, condition on the uh, structural performance, uh, moderate depth tunnel and subsoil and deep tunnel and rock. We identified those as critical cases uh, and the temperature of soil, it's specific in case of clay, that's what we studied, made um, a difference uh, that deserves more uh, studying. And then the results actually indeed also showed that um, fire protection design in tunnels driven by serviceability and downtime rather than you know, collapse. And uh, finally, we did uh, tests, uh, 80 minute railway tunnel fire test could cause minor to moderate damage based on our um, experiments. And um, a combination of passive, um, such as polypropylene fibers and active fire protection such as fire, uh, fixed firefighting systems could minimize the damage. And uh, hopefully we can use advanced models uh, in combination with observations and non-destructive testing to guide repair work. So this research, as I mentioned at the beginning, was funded through Region 2 University uh, Transportation Consortium uh, Center, Consortium and uh, Rutger Center. Uh, for advanced infrastructure and transportation, as well as the IBE Institute of Bridge Engineering at um, University of Buffalo. And I would like to thank our PhD student who graduated actually, uh, she is now Dr. Nanhua, and Professor Anton Tassari, my collaborator from University of Buffalo. With that, thank you very much. And um, like to have any questions for me. Nigar, thank you very much for your pretty comprehensive presentation on tunnel fire safety. It was really insightful and yeah, it gives a lot of insight on different uh, effects of several variables on fire safety and the consequences. Um, yeah, as, as you said, I would like to invite our attendees to, to write their questions on the chat or yeah, if we could agree on a way to it, yeah. Uh, so let's wait for a minute if they have any questions. And yeah, I'd like to thank you again for the presentation and for agreeing on this uh, really weird time we guess for you. Uh, it's, it's not too, it's it's 10.54 p.m. It's not too late. <laughs> so thank you for agreeing to have it a little bit earlier. I, I think you, you have typically have it uh, later in the afternoon. So I appreciate pushing it forward. Thank you for agreeing. So let me see if we have any questions in the chat or that were sent to me. Just a second. Sure. We can give the audience some time if they're thinking.
Okay, I see okay. one question. Yep. Uh, okay, so the question, I'll probably read it out. So uh, how do you connect the temperature probability distribution from the first part with the structural analysis? Do you choose the most extreme heating per node? Um, that was, that's a very good question, thank you. So uh, I might have, let me see, a backup slide that I could show you. Uh, only thing is that my Zoom is not happy. This is, um, had experienced this problem before. Okay, uh, I may not be able to go into a um, full Zoom mode, but that's okay, these are backup. Um, so uh, the way we did it, uh, is we actually, um, so transferring the, the results from the first step, which is the, again, spatial temporal distribution across uh, to the um, heat transfer as well as the structural analysis part. So these are the measure points. Um, so anything, so halfway between A, um, so we didn't go, all the way to the mesh level because we had 540 cases and it would have been a lot of um, output files to process uh, computationally too much. So uh, the way we did it, um, obviously lower resolution, but anything halfway between points A and B will get A temperature and then between um, this point to B and then continued here gets the B temperature and then all the way down C temperature. Um, and But these change across um, um, based on uh, every 10 meters basically get updated. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you for, for your comprehensive answer. Uh... Yeah, I think that answers it. Um, I'm just waiting if there is another question from the audience. Sure. Yeah. Miller, yes. Uh, can you share the source that you use for the temperature versus concrete spalling relationship? Sure. Does it depend on concrete strength and rate of uh, temperature rise to this year's appearance like change the surface that's exposed to fire. So um, sure, I can. Um, basically, what I would uh, for you to so there is a table we actually that part is published so you transfer there you go um this is this is um ah see i knew that my uh system is not happy so this is the paper um 2021 it's our paper characterizing damage in a concrete lining during a fire there is a table in there that lists all the experiments that we collected uh, that's all majority of them come from the um, spalling um, workshop that happens um, can't remember every few years uh, when they're proceedings. So we collected from all of those papers the experimental data from the field and then um, then, so it depends on um, basically the, the table and the table we have in the paper, it reports um, the temperature that uh, in that experiment, um, given the condition, you know, there's also all of those listed, the temperature that the spalling started and at what rate and so on. So that's where um, our um, input for this model comes from. And what's happening is that indeed, as soon as one layer is removed, the heat transfer within Saphir is updated uh, so that the exposed surface is now being heated to the fire. So that boundary um, elements um, to expose to heat are updated. Thank you for your response, Nicole. Yeah, again. Um, just just a quick question out of curiosity. You were sure. mentioning you were uh, not collaborating, but you were getting some input from fire services uh, for the mm -hmm. fire scenarios. Did it, yes. Were you able to model the scenarios that they were intending to see the failure of the of the tunnel? Uh, 
or that was not possible? No, that was not. So the reason, so the way this, the project, uh, especially with the, um, the, the funding project, we do have stakeholders and we receive input from uh, engineers as well as any potential stakeholder who's interested in this, in the research. So we, at some point we um, had received input from fire chief and uh, at that point we had not done the analysis for the something like rws curve in the sense that it, the fire continues all of our analysis at that point um, focused on our 540 cases with in, which included cooling and um, the theme for us was right damage right so we were saying that this is probably not going to collapse and the question came from the fire chief in a sense that from the safety point of view uh, he said okay if you're going in we want to know that okay if it even if it collapses at 50 hours or 60 hours what when is it so that we have some margin and that prompted uh, the part that we just exposed the tunnel section to, you know, 100 hours of RWS just to see if it collapses and if it does at what time. And basically, in response to um, his question. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it was mostly out of curiosity. I think we have another question in the chat. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. So what's the feedback from tunnel designers on your research? What potential changes in the design process could come from this very comprehensive process? Uh, so we are still actually um, what we have um, showed this results to uh, two committees here in the US um, and uh, Ashdo and ACI. And uh, both of them um, are interested in this work. Um, ACI, indeed, before even our work, ACI has um, um, been working on updating uh, some of their documents, especially for fire and concrete in terms of design and um, damage assessment. So ACI looks at it in a broader perspective, let's say. Ashto is more, okay, it's, you know, tunnels, but bridges, that's their, you know, transportation focused, uh, whereas ACI is looking at it in a broader perspective. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we are going to continue. So there's nothing definite at this point because we're still working on that table, suggested table that um, I showed at the end uh, for pushing, uh, a little bit more science-based, um, um, science, yeah, science-based or evidence-based uh, categories in terms of model outputs. Some of it is, uh, we, it's challenging to be honest, you know, putting thresholds on displacement. Uh, sometimes when we talk to our stakeholders, we ask them because we put this together, we even put together a question and said, okay, what do you think? Um, sometimes it's hard, uh, to really um, uh, put uh, a definite value uh, for us and for them, but that's an ongoing process. So to answer your question, we are working on it, but there's nothing yet um, confirmed uh, as the project continues. Thank you, Nigar. Um... So, yeah, I would like to thank you again for uh, you. the presentation, for answering all the questions from our audience today. And yeah, and if you have any resources you would like to ask to share with the, our subscribers and our members, feel free to do so. We will make them reach that destination. Sure. And I would um, uh, like to add one quick thing. Uh, please feel free, uh, audience. You can always send me an email if you have any questions or there is anything, you know, um, a follow-up question I could help with. I would be happy to respond. And um, thanks for great questions. And again, thank you for um, uh, uh, definitely feel free to contact me and thank you for the invitation again. Uh, I uh, enjoyed, I know you're far away, but I do enjoy talking with colleagues and uh, stay connected uh, within the fire world, uh, different parts uh, of the world. It is great. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, 
Uh, I would also like to share a couple of things before closing the meeting. So I'd like to share our next event uh, related to high-rise timber buildings. Our presenter is going to be uh, David Barber from Arup, and he's going to talk on his experience uh, on different projects. So yeah, I will post the, the um, link in the chat. And also, uh, I'd like to remind our attendees that this, um, this presentation, this webinar, is going to be recorded and made available in our YouTube channel. You can look for us as the SFP UQ student chapter. Uh, so yeah, you will be able to find all, all our previous seminars, including, including this one when we process it. So. Nagar, thank you very much. Thank you to our attendees. And I hope you have an amazing weekend and Friday. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>